okay? <laughs> Let me give you a fabulous introduction, okay? Mm. <laughs> I'm having a conversation tonight with one of my good friends who is a famed, award-winning <laughs> <laughs> uh, television producer, filmmaker, director, Miss Inika Nora. <laughs> some applause. I need some applause. I need some applause. <laughs> hey, boo. What's good? How you doing? Everything is amazing. And I love watching you. I'm so proud of you. I love watching your growth. Thank you are you absolutely much. amazing in every single way. I mean, to be honest, like you're so much a part of my growth. You know what I'm saying? Like you have supported me from day one when I was like just a young lesbian. You was a baby dyke. I was baby. I never really went to lesbian clubs like that, but my friends wanted to go sometimes. So I said once in a while I would drop in and there you was sitting there like a queen bee as you are. And you had your um, friends with you and y'all had the dollhouse and it was all the pink dresses and the girliness. And you was like, come here. You was like, here, here, come sit in this VIP section. Come and sit come with us. Us. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you know, mad young. Um, but you always showed respect. You showed up to every one of my birthday parties. I miss a birthday. You're such a friend. You showed up to, I mean, since I've been doing movies, every step I take up, you're there coming to help me with certain projects that I was doing, certain trailers for movies that are like real movies now. We sat up there in that office where I watched you edit that uh, trailer. <laughs> yeah, and th that film just got financed, finally, this week. So the true, the, the church doc. So I'm actually able to make it now. Yes. That. And, you know, we're gonna have to bring you on to that. And I just feel like, I feel like, you know, I, I'm so appreciative of you and our friendship in our relationship, you're one of the best people I know in the entire world. And so Aww, I, don't make me cry. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, it's, true. it's true. I love you to death, Nay. Oh, from now on, I'm gonna be calling her Nay, just to let y'all know. <laughs> I don't call her Nay, I call her Nay. <laughs> and we're about to have a conversation. So we're about to, you know, get comfortable. So we did all the history. You know that I love you. You love it is what it is. Let's talk about you. Tuesday in Louisville, out there for Brianna Taylor. Yeah. Get into that. Um, so I'm working on a project with a production company for a movie that I'm doing leading up to the elections. Um, you know, I was working on other movies, but I decided that I needed to do this movie because I need to make time for this movie because I was like, how can I I think I'm an activist first, to be honest. Like, I don't think I'm a, I'm a director for the art's sake. Like, oh, I just want to create that. I'm not that person. I really want to see change. And I really use film as a medium to communicate a message. And that's the Black message and shifting the Black narrative into one that is hopeful, one that is aspirational. And so when this project came to me about the elections, it was based around one particular political person. And I felt like it needed a broader voice of blackness. Like there's so many different ways we're black and so many different ways that, you know, we can be activists. So I, I joined the movie and I got to put people in the film that I have interacted with. And one of those people was uh, this, this, this girl, her name is Leslie Redmond. She's the president of uh, the NAACP in Minneapolis. She was on the front lines when George Floyd passed. And I saw this speech that she gave with Tamika Mallory um, at the Both memorial of them are amazing. Yeah, of George Floyd. And I, I live for Leslie. And I said, Leslie's voice has to be a part of this. She's incredible. And part of the reason I took the project is because I was like, I want to put Leslie's voice in the forefront. Like sometimes I see people and I'm like, I see the, 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 the purpose in their voice. And so um, I wanted to, I needed to film her. She said she was going to um, Kentucky with Tamika Mallory. Tamika Mallory was doing direct action for Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor is a black woman. And personally, I am moved by black women. I feel like so often nobody is fighting for black women and black women fight for everybody. They fight for white women. They fight for black men, especially. And they, we rarely fight for ourselves. Nobody know? fights for us. And nobody fights for us. And um, 
So I feel like this Breonna Taylor case was like a personal thing for me. And because, um, and, and Tamika called Leslie, who's up next. She's only 26 years old and she's a president of the NAACP. She passed the bar on the first try. And I knew Leslie's voice at this direct action was going to be significant. I had no idea what that direct action was going to be till I got there. And when we got there, you know, we walked, we were going somewhere and we did not know where we were going and we realized- we But they were, didn't tell you that they were going to the attorney general's house. They did not say that, no. Um, and so, you know, we, we ended up there and you know, those protesters decided to sit on his lawn. And I saw they, that. And they were like, yo, you know, if, this man, if these police officers can go into Breonna Taylor's house and kill her, why can't we just sit peacefully on, on your lawn and demand that these cops be arrested? And so the fact that they, you know, sat there peacefully linking arms was such a powerful moment with all the freedom fighters. I mean, there was also like Portia from Real Housewives of Atlanta. I there. saw her. There was also Yandy and Portia's family. I think they were activists. So I think she's trying to get into what her family was into. Uh, Yandy was there. Tamika Mallory, Linda Saysor from the women's movement. Um, and uh, literally there were YBN Corday, the rapper. There was just like a bunch of people there and other people who decided that they wanted to seek justice in that way. But what happened was we got there, the police came and they started arresting people to get off of his lawn. He was on a vacation. Um, he oh, was so not, he wasn't there. He was not there. He was on a vacation. So nobody came outside. And then they were supposed to charge everybody with trespassing. And they got charged with felonies. Let's discuss that. That's, I saw that. That's terrible. Um, I mean, just to have a felony, that prevents you from doing... A lot of things. things. Yeah. So just the fact that that's now going to impact people's lives, just because you don't want to have these cops arrested, is atrocious and ridiculous. And as far as I know, they're not going to stop anytime soon. They're going to keep going to his house until then. What also happened there is the neighbors, there was neighbors across the street, there was neighbors down the block. At that point, um, one of the neighbors has said, hey, you guys can come sit on our lawn. We're offering up our lawn to you to stand wow. with you. Wow. But that was that, it that black that or was it was white? Down the block. It was, yeah, was that it? They, they were white. Okay. They were down the block. However, right across from the attorney general's house was a, a white couple that were across the street and they told us that they wanted us out of the neighborhood too so they put caution tape so that we couldn't even stand in the street anymore it was beyond couple the, did this the the neighbor the neighbor um did this across from the attorney general's house so you just have like at first we were standing some of us were standing on the street some of us were sitting on the lawn and then um, we were still allowed to stand on the street, but when the cops came, the neighbors basically came and, and asked for caution tape to be put up so we could be off of their block. Because technically the street is like not private property. It's once you step on the grass. Right. But they, they, they kicked us off of the actual street itself. So, I saw one of the police officers push you. Yeah, you saw that, right? I did. Literally, um, the police officer pushed me and it took a lot to not retaliate, to be honest. I'm not Martin Luther King. I'm probably more Malcolm X, but- um, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I'm definitely not, not that one, but I feel like my bigger purpose is to tell this story and to be a vessel to communicate the message to the mass, the masses. And so what was so difficult about that moment is I kept having to, you know, it's like, I wanna go do this, but I gotta, I have to, observe everything. I have to capture everything. So I have to realize that my ministry is in a different space. So I can't really react the way I always want to. But it's so hard as someone who cares and who's someone who's not, who's very intolerant of injustice, racism, disrespect, um, any of those things. Yeah, discrimination. So um, yeah, that was a very difficult part. Um, Leslie, you know, who I was following ended up getting arrested. They all got out. The next Yandy morning. got arrested as well, right? Yeah, Yandy, Portia, Tamika, all, of them. all yep. of them. All of them got arrested. Tamika. And was they hit with felonies? Um, yeah, they were. And the people around the people, um, it's so interesting. The people, the white people, the white allies that we had with us, they always did everything first. So they created a barrier 
for the black people. So they made sure that the white people got arrested first because they sat on the ends so that if, you know, they could, they, they put themselves on the front lines first because they're always taking up, you know, spaces right. in ways and, or they're like considered safe. So they were kind right. of a protective barrier in this weird way there. So that also was something different. Um, that I saw, but they they were not supposed to get hit with them felony charges. But I guess the attorney general decided to be petty, who's also black. So that's just like what? Yeah, I don't understand that at all. But in the, it's racist. Um, sorry, this like this idea of like unfair treatment is not just a a white thing. It comes from black people. Black too, people as and well. That's unfortunate. You know, it's unfortunate. I saw the black cop behind the white cops online. And you was talking to him, and he wouldn't even speak. He wouldn't even acknowledge you. Yeah. He just basically ignored you, yep. which yeah, is so fact. hard to watch because I'm sure he has a family. Mm -hmm. So when I think of Brianna Taylor, I think about I have a daughter, Tatiana's 26 years old, who lives on her own. What if cops just run up in her house because they think that she did something wrong and kill her? Like, Breonna Taylor could be all of our daughters. Absolutely. So, I'm sure he has a family. This doesn't affect him. Yeah. Like, the system destroys Black people deeper than what we think. Absolutely. It, it creates a, it, it puts us in a maze. We're like, this hamster on a hamster wheel, or, you know, there's just like, no matter what- Crabs in a barrel. Yeah, you just go this way, and- you get caught and you turn and you never, you can't quite get out of it. And so we have to be thinking of more strategic ways to combat a lot of these things. Um, and I believe that it needs to happen ep economically and psychologically. Um, it does. So those are the things that I'm working on figuring out how I communicate those things, economics and psychological well-being through film and through programs and stuff like that that's like where my focus is there and it's also seeing that if i follow all these different activists in my film leading up to the elections will the people the viewers at home come up with new solutions because they might be able to watch you can watch people in the act of like trying all these different things and if they don't work or if some things work on one end and they don't work on another. Maybe if we just adjusted our plan a little bit, maybe there's something new that we could come up with. So that's my hope um, in the project. And you know, it's really hard, day like just to do projects on activism uh, things because I never get a break from the oppressive narratives. Like all the films I'm doing are creating hope for stories like this. I don't feed into stereotypes in the stories that I tell. I always make some caveat where there's some wonderment and excitement and humor and entertainment. So I'll throw that in there, but the reality of everything, like even the Nigeria doc I'm doing, like I'm sitting here day after day dealing with the oppressive stuff. So, so much- They're very life, oppressed in Nigeria. Yeah, and so much, just so much of their lives are so real and so, it's like no break from the constant these stories and then on top of it there's a pandemic so you're stuck it's like i'm stuck in the in it like just seeing it there's no way to not see it and um it's so hard being between like wanting to be an activist wanting to be outside on the front lines but you got these movies do the movies are a form of activism because they're talking about the same things um and just not even being able to have a break to like just be have fun and do stuff that just really is not surrounded by that. So that's been kind of- Yeah, I haven't seen you and had fun with you in a long time. Yeah, I haven't had fun with myself in a long time just from <laughs> <laughs> all this, just to be honest, all this work, it's a lot of work. And people see Instagram, um, people see Instagram, but they don't really get to see the work that goes into one video they might see, you know, it you have no idea. It took hours to edit that. Yeah, every, it took hours or just, I've been in the house for, you know, a month for 19 hours a day, working on films, falling asleep, waking back up, showering, exercising, right back to the film. There's no games. I work very, very, very hard. And a lot of people think, oh, it's shit. Like I'm moseying around Beverly Hills. And I'm like, nah, like I'm really busting my, my, my behind and I'm investing my own money half the time. And then it leads to greater things as, as it comes and it builds, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work and a lot of mental 
energy and really most of my time, to be honest. I haven't done anything else besides work in the last year, so. Probably longer than that. Yeah, definitely. Yo, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's very, very true. So, we talked about Brianna Taylor and um, your ways that you feel economically and um, you said teaching and through education that you want to bring change. A lot of people like myself, I constantly say, say her name, remember her name, Brianna Taylor. What can we do if we can't come out to Louisville with you? What could we do? Just the normal society and the community to help the situation. I think definitely, um, well, in some spaces, like for example, like when people got arrested, people could have called in to the police station demanding the release of them. The demand uh, of it helps. Um, also, a lot of things like in terms of these laws, um, really understanding what the laws are places and figuring out how you might be able to run for office in your hometowns. Like if you really want to make a difference, there's so many different ways. You know, maybe you need to tell Breonna Taylor's story through film. Like there's just, you have, I feel like it's so hard because everybody thinks doing something about something looks one way. But to me, it's it like, doesn't. you have to look at your organic gifts. What am I gifted at? Some people like, you might have a lot of money. So you might be able to bail the protesters out. So they feel empowered to go protest. You can't be there, but you can send money. So when they need to get out, the protesters can get bailed out. You can, you know, d send money to the family. You know what I mean? You can. Um, yeah, Breonna Taylor, doesn't she have a GoFundMe? I believe or something? she has a GoFundMe. And then until, if you go to Until Freedom's website, that's Tamika Mallory's website, she's on um, the, she's on this whole uh, Breonna Taylor thing and like, she has a lot of commands on her lead on exactly how you can help Breonna Taylor. So I yeah, I saw that and I posted it on my page. Yeah, until freedom is is a is a big way, and I think supporting the activists that you know are supporting the case or the lawyers um, financially, and then you know we all go take trips to Bali and we go to all these different places and do these different things. We could fucking go to Kentucky. Just go. I've never been to Kentucky. Yeah, there's power. <laughs> me too. And it's the whiskey hometown. So that was good for me. <laughs> that was good for you, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, whiskey and fighting for justice, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, that, you know, stuff like that. It's important. The power, there's power in numbers. So as much as we can, you know, that $100 flight to go down there might not hurt. Or if you can't get out your house, just calling, making a phone call. Um, we're posting the memes, but that shit is easy. Like, to really figure out what is organic to you that you're gifted at that you could do. You know, maybe you're a promoter. Maybe you could call one of your promoter friends to get more people to go out if you know people that live by Kentucky or you could pay for people to go on a bus or whatever it is. Or you could send the protesters masks or any, you know, any anything like that. You figure out where, how you could be helpful that's in a like tangible way. All right, so you heard it here first on what you can do to help Brianna Taylor. It's very important, especially she's a black woman. We the most disrespected, unappreciated of the race that we need to do something about this. Absolutely. Whatever you can do organically and authentically, please try to do. All right, let's talk about your work because I've seen you grow. I've seen you grow. Like every time you tell me, oh, out the blue, you was like, oh, yeah, I'm producing Black Girls Rock. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, really? And you talk to me, you tell me these things so humbly. Like, it's, you're always going to be nay with the little converses on. Like, you're never, ever going to be, like, big. Where people make money and they forget about their friends, that's not you. And I watch you from BT, Black Girls Rock, same difference that toured everywhere, from Paris to New York to Cali, it was everywhere and back again. Another screen, <laughs> it's bringing it back, it's bringing it back. And now you have, truth be told, 
Truth is that the name? I got an HBO feature film. Oh, well, the Nigerian. Let's talk about yeah. that because that has a ballroom scene, right? Yeah, I got, yeah, I got a Lionsgate project. I mean, I did My House on Viceland before. My House with Tatiana and Precious. First and last. Um, that's First and last on Netflix. Netflix. Um, my, ne my next film to come out will be the HBO feature film. And then I'm doing that in conjunction with John Legend's production company. I got a Lionsgate project with Queen Latifah's company. Um, and um, I'm starting my own production company with my partner and co-director Giselle Bailey. I love G baby. <laughs> yeah. We're, bu we're building an empire together. She's incredible. And you know, she works equally as hard as me. And yes. we both, I mean, you know how just somebody just, I don't know, we, our missions aligned at one point and I just knew I was supposed to work with this girl and other things. And I was just like, mm -hmm, this is it. And it really, I don't know, just really, it's that's a puzzle about, piece. Yeah, she was, and we're about to build our company together. And so that's exciting, um, just being able to build um, a legacy together. And so that's where all of our focus and our energy has been going into since we met, since the very first day we met on, on Advice Land, my house. I was around when y'all first met. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you remember all those good stories. And like I, you know, so I'm 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 starting my, my I'm growing my production company. Our first film is an HBO feature coming out um, at the top of next year. Um, it'll be done this. Let's year. Let's talk so, about it. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. it was shot in Nigeria. Yeah, it was shot in Nigeria, and it's about the underground nonconformist scene. You know, people who are out there who are alternative, who may or may not identify in the LGBT community, and some have moved to the U.S., some are still out there, but we really talk about who that community is, what they stand for, and we're, you know, this is their coming out story, you know, the nonconformist scene and how um, their unique expression um, is in everybody and they inspire the country, you know, to be themselves and define themselves for themselves. It's not a, it's not a film about sexuality at all. Um, and that's what's beautiful. It's going to be one of those films that relates to the LGBT community, but it's not just about, it's not about sexuality, you know, it's about way much more expression, gender expression and things like that. So I'm very excited about that movie because my dad's Nigerian, I'm half Nigerian, I'm Igbo. Um, and so to be able to bring all of my cultures together is iconic to me and to be able to get help, give a platform to that community who needs help and, but who also needs, um, support and love and they deserve the attention they get because they're beautiful um, human beings and they deserve for us to tell our own stories because quite often you see white people telling African stories and that's yeah, right. every everywhere everywhere I go with my crew we're always the only black crew like even what we shot yesterday there was other crews there but they were all white crews we're the only black crew so everybody was like all the white media to the back let's let's only let's get all the black media to the front um, that's good last time and so um, my crew, you know, I brought a black crew to Nigeria to shoot. And I thought that was very powerful, too, because a lot of people don't do that. That never gets to happen. And starting a production company with two black women and two black queer women is, like, epic. It's really, really epic. Are, was are it dangerous? Are these questions for me at the bottom? They have questions. No, that's probably Javon talking to us. Okay. Oh, uh, Javon said, are you including the trans community when you're having casting calls? Oh, absolutely. What's so funny? What's so funny is the same difference. Pretty much most of the people that were in that film are all, they've all transitioned now. They're trans men. Um, they've transitioned or uh, men of trans experience. Like they have completely transitioned. I feel like I'm the only one, me and maybe like two other people are the only ones who still um, identify as um, women. Um, the trans community is super important to me. I want to actually do something with the trans um, community. I mean, I've done it with my house, but I want right. to do something specific to trans men. Um, uh, and I'm I'm actually working on that right now with uh, Marquise. Um, uh, I love Marquise. I don't know if you guys know Marquise, but um, he was in the Aggressives, the movie. And right. um, 
we did a little sit down uh, talking about uh, masculine of center lesbian women and trans men and like how come our communities are so divided and how do we right. have a community and when you came from one community to another right and how does toxic masculinity play into that and so we've had we had a lot of trans men a part of that we had uh, Marquise we had um to to sean was in it i don't know if you know him he was a part of black trans tv um formerly um but he's a great person and um jc on um as well jc on's beautiful man as well who else do we have oh my god so many teak milan oh i love well, teak a part of it um and who am i you need to bring javon a part of it yeah, I mean, I want to I want to do something on that because you know what I feel like I honestly and maybe they don't feel this way about me, but I feel like trans men are a part of my community. Um, I do, you know, I think I've even had like questions about myself at times. We had that conversation. Yeah, that's not where I land. I didn't land on that. I'm um, a trans man. I landed, you know, I do like being a woman politically. You know, I don't like being a girl because I feel like I don't um, adhere to the inferiority that people try to throw. But we need you on the woman's side. I we wanna, need a yeah, strong woman like I want to be. I want to be a woman and be all the things that they say that a man needs to be. Mm. Um, and that's just my personal experience. But in terms of trans men, they have a different experience that is, is it should be valued, should be respected, should be honored, and they deserve to have way more of a voice um and i feel like that is a part of my community and i feel like we kind of all a lot of us came from the same roots <laughs> even though we might right. look different now we all came from the same roots some of us struggle with the same pain and so i really want to be able to highlight both of that i continue to give a voice to masculine of center lesbian women and trans men is something that that i'm always going to be actively working on especially in my films too. I'm gonna start doing narrative films soon and I wanna make sure that um, trans men are a part of those stories. Good. And they play- Javon kind of also people. asks, what are your views on Nick Cannon's situation? Um, on Nick Cannon's situation, I, to be honest, I didn't hear the um, comment that he made. So I can't comment on the comment, but for Viacom to cancel him, I mean, I, I hate cancel culture. Um, I feel like, Let's give an opportunity to educate. If people get things wrong, take the time to educate on it. What I do know is Nick Cannon is a beautiful human being. He is. He's done as singer, he's done Wild and Out. Um, a lot of my friends, personally, he's employed over and over. Davida. And, over and every time they needed anything, um, even my barber, my barber's his barber for Wild and Out. Like he's literally, and there's been a million seasons of that. People have been making, you know, our community has been making money off that show. He's come up with these ideas. It just goes to show, you know, sometimes God moves in a certain way. And I feel like God is trying to tell Nick that he can start his own network. You know, yeah. I mean, you're making them billions of dollars. You right. And I think we need to start owning stuff as black people so nobody can tell us to get out. We can say what we want. They, you know, everybody else is doing and saying what they want. So I feel like Nick, you know, I, I don't, you know, I hope that there was nothing offensive really meant and i doubt that he intended yeah for it because he's a very kind person so if you felt like you need to have a conversation hit up him tell him to make the apology and, and go so it sounds like somebody wanted him out to me because that could have been a conversation for someone who's been so loyal to you guys he does team nick he does for years yeah it's just like nah that don't that don't sound right it sounded like somebody wasn't liking something and you know i think that god should I think Devon he, said that he apologized. I didn't see that. Yeah, I, I heard, I seen in the article that he apologized. And I wonder if, you know, the Jewish community ain't no joke. You know, they've been- They stand together. Yeah, and they've been our allies in certain ways. And I feel like- um, But in certain ways, they've been against us. It's a hard political move. And I, I'm just saying that the systems that we're in, in America, set us up to have to like need to be political with specific groups of people which is unfortunate but i think whatever he believes in he should stand on what he believes in and just explain his intent is was not to offend anybody but i think if he has a belief and it's not something that he's trying he to stand on his belief 
and you always stand on your belief. So that's, again, that's me speaking without actually knowing the nuance of what he said, so. All right. Um, God, I have so many comments. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get to the comments because we're actually, oh, sorry. We're actually streaming on Javon's page, my page, and on prettytomboys.tv. Um, so there's a lot of comments and we're having a very, very, deep conversation. So I'm going to try to get to the comments um, as much as possible. I want to discuss um, two things. First, I want to backtrack and go into the same difference. Yep. Um, because actually when I was in Atlanta recently, I purchased it because I like when I say, oh, have you seen same difference? And somebody says, no, usually people don't say no. But when they <laughs> say no, I'm like, nay. I need that film. I need to show them this film because it was the realest thing. I know we had Paris is burning. We had the aggressors. But same difference was the realest thing New York has seen in such a long time. It broke down how we as a community broke our community down into these little tiny boxes and then we're fighting that we don't want to be in a box, but our own community has broken it down to femmes, femme aggressors, AGs, trans, um, pillow princesses, and all the stuff that we talk about in the group prettytomboys.com. But you dissected it so well. You had a pregnant stud. You had... Um, Miss, um, what is her name? Yes. Tiffany Alexander, yes. but what was her name back then? Her stripper King name. Kells. What is her name? King Kells. King Kells, right, but her name is Tiffany. King yes. Kells, where they was discriminating against her because she was quote unquote an AG, but she wore weaves. Uh huh. Um, you broke, you follow the story of Snoop from The Wire, where she now wanted to be in roles that's not like putting her in a box of just being the gangbanger, somebody in jail, a hard AG. She wanted to show a softer side of her and they showed her dressing up in heels to try to get a role. You show the bisexual, where for some reason, lesbians shun the bisexual. Like they're not part of our community as well because they want to be with men and women. Let's discuss that because today we bring up these topics all the time in the group that I help run with Gina. And um, the labels are still here. There's some people that will say that they are no label, but in actuality, the labels are still here deep and rooted in our community, deep and rooted. Let's discuss. Yeah, um, I feel like it's so funny because now everybody's like, what's your pronoun? Right. You know, and when I made the same difference, nobody was talking about that. When I made the same difference, Obama hadn't even said that we could all get married in all the states. Right. Like, so people don't understand that when the same difference came out, there was no space. Like, they, nobody was talking about no black lesbians. You know, Lena Waithe wasn't, you know, out there on a show. This None of these things were... Present. Oh, yeah, was Ellen. Ellen came out. Yeah, exactly. We just and she Ellen. wasn't a woman of color. Black. Right. You know, and so it was when I used to be talking about I'm gonna make this film and it's gonna be about these black lesbians, people was like, huh? And I'm just like, okay, well, I'm gonna still make it because I care about it. You know what I mean? Cause I try to pitch that so many times to um to um BT, which is so funny because 20s was pitched to to uh, BT back when I worked there. I worked there back um, like eight years ago and 20s was pitched and they passed on it. They were like, no. So like these things couldn't even happen back then. The things that are happening now are like revolutionary. Um, but I felt like, you know, I came up and somebody introduced me to the lesbian world by, you know, I always mess with girls. So I'm not even gonna lie about that. But then when I basically maybe like got to high school, I think that's when I started dating women because I had like I thought okay I'm just be like everybody else like I wasn't trying to fight myself I just figured you just get a boyfriend and it's all good you do your shit on the low but then I realized 
oh no, like this is a thing. And so I had a, a young girl named Rainisha who like went to my high school and she was like, yeah, I'm about to go pick up my baby mother. And I was like, your baby mother? I was like, how? Like, you like <laughs> girls, right? <laughs> I was so confused. I was like, what? So I'm like curious. I'm like, who are we going to pick up? Like, I'm just going with her. And then it's a girl. She kisses the girl. I, I remember Rainisha had a do-rag on. The girl had just had a baby. So I was extra confused. I'm like, wait, she had a baby. You're her baby. What? So I was just like completely confused. So I had to break my mind open a little bit. And then she was like, yeah, you know, in the community, there's studs, there's femmes, there's this. And then there was a Black Planet page. I don't know if you remember Black Yes, Planet. Black Planet. I came down out, late. I found out about studs on Black Planet. And I found about the aggressives on Black Planet. And on Black Planet, there was this uh, page called Dyke Categories. And it literally broke down a femme, this, a stud, this, a pillow princess, this. And it gave all the definitions. And so I'm reading them and I'm trying to figure out which one am I. I'm like going through stuff. And then nothing quite fit. I was like, I feel like I possess a lot of masculinity and I possess femininity. And I felt like anytime I chose one for the other, I didn't feel authentic. And so I was like, I must not be the only person who feels this way. And then when I talk to a lot of women, especially a lot of masculine of center women, I, I, I heard a lot of things that to me sounded like it was just a lack of vulnerability happening. Um, and then power dynamics and not wanting to fall into this submissive role. It was like, you have this leading role in your right. own stage play. And it felt very, every time I went to the lesbian parties, it felt like there was a lot of, um, it felt like a play. It felt like Shakespeare to me. It felt like, okay, well, if I'm a stud and you're a stud, we have to look evil at each other. Like we're playing something we saw, like we're playing pretend but we're adults. So I didn't really like- You're playing heterosexual. But yeah. you saw in movies what the right. man do. Exactly. Now you're trying to be that. Exactly. And that's what I felt. I felt like none of it was authentic because I feel like there's all times where we might feel emotional. There's all times like, I remember I always wanted kids. Like, and so I'm like, wait, I'm a stud so I can't have kids? I'm confused. Wait, what? what's the deal? Like, and I was like, no, I'm a woman, but I'm masculine presenting. So I always wanted to create a space to have a conversation around people who felt like me, who felt like they had a more of a dichotomy between the two or free people who felt caged into their own role that they created for themselves. And I also wanted to take that further, which I didn't get to do in this, in the same difference, but psychologically the toll that has on masculine presenting women just to fit into what the stereotypical male is when you're actually a woman, that's like breaking your own heart and then going after these women that expect you to be like that. Right. Um, it's heartbreaking because you want love and you feel like you have to be someone else to attain love. And I felt like that was the most heartbreaking heartbreak part of it. And so I wanted to affirm vulnerability. I wanted to affirm duality. I wanted to um, affirm double consciousness. I wanted to affirm, you know, just people who can be multifaceted um and and really show how we need to do better as a community to come together and stop policing each other because we have thank to you a lot and so um it's so funny after the same difference it, or when i was shooting it i would go in to shoot scenes and people think i'm adapt them up because of how i dress right and i wasn't i didn't wear makeup i didn't have nails done back then i was a different person back then so y'all also have to understand i look completely different when i made the movie um um and I've evolved since, you know, in terms of my gender expression and how I feel, um, feels natural to me, but they expect me to dap them up and I would go give them a hug. Or I remember <laughs> one time I went to, all these studs had like a panel that I shot and, and they were like, I was talking about being touched, the touch me not. And um, I was like- We're gonna have a show on those as yeah. well. And I was like, you guys don't get touched? Like, what's <laughs> And then everybody looked at me like, what? That would be after my 50 year anniversary when I was with a girl for 50 years. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> so like, my bad. Um, but, and I felt like a lot of, um, a lot of those um, people are, have transitioned now. But, um, so there might've been more going on there that we didn't right. know yes. the language. There was no language for that. Um, but I felt like, you know, I would try to psychologically switch up how I did my interviews. Like, okay, if, if you about to dap me up, I'm gonna give you a hug. 
And that really broke people, that like calmed people down and made people less defensive and more vulnerable. So I feel like what people are attracted to about the film is it's so raw and real and honest. It is. On how people feel. And I went in, I try to enter those scenes with love. I just know. I try to enter those scenes with love. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that, um, that energy helped open up the community because every city I would go to all over the country, outside of the country, at the end, people come up to you and they're like, oh, I've been waiting to be like this my whole life or I never thought I could say my feelings. And I think we have to be, I think, to be honest, I think the masculine of center uh, Black lesbians need extreme therapy and trans men too. Like, not that everybody doesn't, but especially because um, all the heartbreak that we faced and everybody trying to put perform this yes. idea of- Putting you in a box. You can never actually, you can never actually attain that because that's not us. You know right. what I'm saying? And so you're trying to attain something that is, feels like it's unattainable and you get let down every time and people ignore you. You're barely told that you're beautiful half the time because you know, some of us haven't put, didn't, I remember back then I didn't put a lot into my image or how I looked, you know, cause I thought it didn't matter. You know what I mean? And I realized, no, like being masculine center doesn't mean not caring for yourself or right. anything like that. So I think that, um, the film opened the community up and a lot of people don't talk about it because now it seems so natural, but the film was a catalyst for the community, the lesbian community becoming more androgynous, becoming more open, getting more roles in Hollywood. People seen that movie and knew that like, okay, these people can exist in a Hollywood film or they can exist right. in television, which wasn't a conversation at some point. So I feel like it's definitely changed the way people look at labels and gender roles and things like that. All right, we have a couple questions that Javon put in before I get into my next topic. Somebody wants to know, and this question is for both of us, okay. how do we feel about long distance relationships? Nah, not okay for me. with it. Not for me, because I work so much. I work a lot, and my work is first, and it's so weird. I feel like I can't even be in a relationship if the person isn't working with me, because I think I've dedicated my life to my mission, so... I will, I don't make time for anything else. And I really sacrificed, I think I sacrificed certain elements of love and the traditional relationships for my career. So I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't personally do a long distance relationship. I could. Um, another question is someone asks, how do you find the women for your films and documentaries? Well, the same difference was really word of mouth, which is so beautiful to have a film that's that successful from word of mouth. We marketed that with all the leaders in the community. I reached out to them. I posted and I said, hey, I'm looking for stud on stud. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. And people <laughs> literally posted it. And people just wrote in to me like, here's my story. Here's my story. Here's my story. Word of mouth. And then I went on YouTube and I looked at a lot of people who are on YouTube that told stories that I felt needed to be told on a bigger scale. And I found them and I reached out to them directly to become a part of the movie, like Snoop, like Kells. Those are all people I saw online that I didn't actually know, but I always felt connected to their story, um, particularly, and I wanted to highlight that. Because um, these are all things that I've experienced, done, or went through in different right. categories. All right, let's get into, um, what is the name, because you changed it. Uh, is it Truth Be Told now? Truth Be Told, yep. Okay, Truth Be Told. Let's discuss that because that's powerful. <laughs> I was there when you was uh, doing the trailer. <laughs> we was in the Essence offices, uh -huh. taking a break and going over there and getting my snacks. <laughs> when you work, let me just say, this is a workaholic. I'm a Virgo, so I'm a workaholic. But, and I've worked with NACA through the years. We went to Puerto Rico together and then Took a little small plane with six people over to where did we go? St. Thomas. St. Thomas. Thomas. She helped us get all those people over there for that <laughs> In Hathaway movie. Yep. I I'll worked with it. her. Mm -hmm. And we're very close friends, but we respect each other's work habit. But I've never seen anybody work as long as you do in one day. And you're serious. When you say 19 hours, I seen it. I seen it. <laughs> I see you like not sleep. When I came over to visit you in Brooklyn, you was like, yeah, I haven't slept. 
Like it just be you, the bed, and your Mac, just the computer, <laughs> and you just go in and go in and go in and go in. I be like, yo, I respect her work ethic. It's like one I've never seen, and I thought that I could work. Girl, you work when it's something that you're passionate about. So now you did same difference. Dealt with the labels. Now you're dealing with something that's also a lot of people in our community need therapy behind the church and what the church has done to us as a community. Absolutely. The church, I mean, I grew up in church in Queens. My grandmother helped uh, found a church called Eternal Love Baptist Church. It's still in Queens, New York right now. So I grew up in church, praise dancing, singing. I moved to Atlanta. I did praise dance. I did uh, Bible study, vacation Bible school. I mean, I was there seven days a week. I was at church as much as I work. And um, I feel like I know all the ins and outs, the good, the bad, and the ugly about church. And what I thought was, <clears throat> I was inspired by telling my own story of like coming out to my church. And when I came out to my church um, in New York, cause I had a girlfriend, they found out that we kissed or something on a church trip, <laughs> a mess. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> the ministers found out um, and they were like, um, Naka, you're so powerful. We love the way you speak to the youth. We want you to be a youth pastor, but you have to decide between gay or that. And um, I was literally like, well, how do y'all police things for God? Like, how does that work? Like, if, if, if I don't decide to not be gay like is a security guard going to walk me out the church like what's the protocol and they had nothing to say and i said cool so i'm just going to enjoy service and i'm going to keep praising god because that's god that's a god that's brought me through this life because god saw something special in me and god gave me this gift and created me in his image so his or her whatever them their image um as a female spirit <laughs> image and <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure God is a black woman. I'm pretty sure. But, I'm pretty um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, no one else is that strong. But like to to really um, you know, I fought my church back and they opened up so much. And so many people joined the church and I still continue to speak. And a lot of people aren't taking that extra step. And so I and then sometimes you're faced with I mean, we're always gonna be faced with opposition and people are gonna always say stuff to us and talk about us. They'll talk about you in church regardless, about your outfit, about anything. And so whether you gay or not. Yeah, exactly. And I wanted to create a space where I feel like our community has so much of God in it. And the fact that we have to separate ourselves is disheartening once we separate ourselves from our families and our parents. Like you need God. You know what I'm saying? God is to me, the source of all. And so um, I wanted to create a project that wasn't just talking about, oh, how terrible uh, gay people are treated. That's every single church religious documentary. We're treated bad, they discriminate against us. Ah, ah. I felt like there are worlds where people get discriminated against and they go, fuck that. And I'm always gonna be the filmmaker that's like, fuck that. And I'm gonna tell the truth and I'm going to, um, you know, really talk about the endurance, what it takes to do the work to get, to to connect. Like, and I'm all about the black family staying together. And so, so many things divide the black family. And for me, you know, I've had times where I was abandoned from my mom. And so families sticking together is important to me. Like same thing with my house. When Tati's a trans woman, right. her mom found out that she was um, trans. At first her mom, you know, she was separated from her mom. She was living on the street. But Tati and her mom reconnected and they started reading books together. And, you know, they were both talking about going to school at the same time. And her mom was starting to understand and accept her. And I want to show that part of it, because if we can learn how to connect in our differences, that's always my point of every film I've ever made. So at first the film was called Rotten Fruit. And I was going right. to talk about how the black LGBT community was, you know, oppressed. And then I was like, that don't even sound like my spirit if I'm making this film, it got to come out of my spirit. And my spirit was, like I said, I'm going to be who I am, who, who, and this is who God called me to be. And I'm going to help teach you about how you're not free, the Black church. So that's when I shifted it to truth be told. And the log line switched to what the Black church, sorry, what the Black LGBT community teaches the Black church about its own oppression. So we're using our freedom to preach to the church and teach them 
What about the women, the women's disempowerment here? What about the faulty stuff with money, the molestation? We going into it all. This is a all the people that go Pastor see Pat. You have Pastor Pat in there. Pastor Pam, oh my God. She's a pastor from Philadelphia and she mm, is like she's she radical. She's the most powerful, radical, political, everything. Like I said, every person I put in my movie represents something that is boiling inside of me. And Pastor Pam is the voice. If I could sound like something, like if I could take it all the way, Pastor Pam says it all. Like she's powerful. <laughs> she's a black lesbian preacher. She has a family. She's funny. She's charismatic. I had a 14,000 seat stadium uh, screening of the same difference in Atlanta for pride one year at the Phillips arena. And I needed speakers to come. And I, I, I asked Pastor Pam to come and she came to Phillips arena. And then we went to Piedmont park after and she got up on that stage and she started preaching and everybody started swarming to the stage because she's, they felt God. Fabulous. Like, sometimes we get separated from our families and our churches and, and God wants, you know, people find out that we're gay. And so, I did that. I even interviewed, um, I have an interview that I haven't put out yet because he, he, he didn't want me to put it out. Um, but we'll see. The guy, um, I am not gay no more, I'm delivered. I got an interview. Oh, with him. right. I saw clips of that that you had. So he's not, he yeah. doesn't want you to bring it out? Well, he, I mean, he's him. So um, we'll see, but we'll see if we can get that in there. But like, I'm coming He's claiming to be straight now, right? Allegedly. I I don't know what's going on with him. Um, I seen him fighting for justice in a YouTube video. So, for um, our justice, um, black justice, yeah, definitely. Oh, black justice. Um, but in terms of like, what I interviewed him about was more so the secrets of the church. So he was telling, he was like, I'm gonna spill the tea on all the church, all the stuff that I know about this Kojic church. So that was his kind of um, angle more than anything. But it's like, we're gonna have, we're gonna hear all types of voices. Um, we're gonna hear all types of voices. And I think that's going to be very, very impactful to, to, to discuss and to just be able to talk about our roots and the ideas. I want the, the ultimate goal is I see a movie theater and I see all the people who haven't seen their grandmoms, their aunts, they all gonna watch this one same movie. If your parents didn't even wanna talk to you anymore or anything, you got estranged, we're gonna come back together for this one movie. And at the Q and A, the, we can ask any questions we want to. And there's also a homophobic pastor who's a character in this film too, who's kind of like the villain, but it'll, it'll help us understand where their mentality is coming from and maybe them ours and we can have a real conversation around the real issue, which is much deeper than any of that. It's about right. oppression. And so dismantling that again within our community. Like I said, I focus on, a lot of people focus on calling out white people. That's not, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm actually here to empower our community and talk about where we can become better at. And once we're in an empowered state, we can start to thrive instead of just trying to be in survival mode all the time, so. I agree. So. When do you think that movie is coming out? Well, I'm a working, documentary. I'm starting, I'm starting to film it. I already started to film it, but I'm filming more at the end of this year. I hope that we can do something in the summer of next year, like the HBO film, you know, at the beginning of the year and then towards the summer, hit them with the truth be told and hopefully vacation. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. No vacation for your birthday next year? I think I'll be working, traveling. We'll see. Um, what's going on with the Diddy Doc? Oh, that's not out yet. You still have to work on or is it completed? Oh, it's not even announced yet. So Oh. Like oh, that. so that was some that was some secret tea right there. <laughs> I smell the tea right there, honey. <laughs> Let me sip on that. <laughs> Y'all keep your mouth shut on that one. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we close out, is there anything else that you want to tell the viewers? Um, follow me on Instagram at Nike's Nay. You can always write me there. Um, please continue to support and make stories. Our stories are so important. Send me your stories. Um. I, I just want to say thank you more so than anything. Thank you for your support, your openness, 
thank you for supporting the same difference because that was a community effort that film and it shows that as black people if we support each other's work look how far we could go that was my very first film i've done so 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 many um projects since then and that is a that is a result of community love and community support and i plan to intend to carry the voice of black lesbians black trans men forward in all my projects and continue the lgbt um narrative i remember i went to texas to do a screening of the same difference and i was like oh my next movie is going to be on the punk and the goth scene you know i'm gonna go to another oppressed group and somebody was like I was like, I don't think I was I was gonna do another LGBT community right a uh, community movie right after this one. And they were like, why not? They were like, we need you. Like we don't have enough. And that shit hit my heart so hard. And I was like, I, I really had to go sit home with that. Like, wait, why are you going somewhere else? Yeah, I was like, I don't make movies for career sake. It's not about being boxed in career wise. I want to be fucking. I want to do a story on my community every time. Why I got to be one of them? It could be all of them. And I proudly go into every meeting and I'm like, nope, change this character. Nope, <laughs> this. Um, I'm about to go into narrative films. I'm about to start making narrative films now with actors and things like that. I'm going into that territory now. And so that's a project that I have coming up soon. And, you know, I just thank God for y'all support. And I'm praying for all of us. I hope your families are safe. I hope your friends are safe. Um, just want to pray for everybody and pray that God continues to direct your life. If you're going through a financial time or any health problems, I pray that God heals and, and helps and moves into your life. And that this, you know, this season is just a, a, a rough patch, but it gets better and brighter and that you, all the dreams that you want come true for you. So that's what I want to say. Uh, we have another question Javon put in. Are you taking stories? And if so, how can they submit? Yeah, um, send me a message um, on Nike's name, the Instagram. Just write me there because that's the easiest way. Right now, my emails are crazy and there's like so much projects going on, but I do go to Instagram sometime for a breath. <laughs> so um, you could just write DM me there. That's the fastest way I'll, I'll see it. Any other questions, Javon? I don't know. Okay, Javon said no. All, All right. right. So this has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Bay. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I think this is dope for you. You should have been doing this. And you're glowing, first of all. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, you gotta tell me about the glowing later. What? I'm gonna tell you about what? Yeah, the you glowing? Glow yeah, that's yeah, I that's a that's a that's a day in May conversation. Yep, waiting for it. <laughs> but we'll be in California. I'll be in California to visit you soon. Good, good. When I come back from Mexico next week. Good, thank and you. And then we'll be able to catch up. Huh? No, I was saying thank you to Javon as well. All right, Javon, in this conversation, Javon is in the background, but Javon is always there. He said, welcome. <laughs> Bella's here. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's 13 years old, my little old lady. Aww. I gotta keep her on my lap throughout the whole conversation or she's gonna bark. <laughs> but I would definitely appreciate you talking to me and talking to all of you. Okay. I love you with all my heart, Nay. I love you too. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course. And uh Javon said, love you long time, many years, appreciate you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> See you soon, babes. All right. Bye. Bye. That's it for Conversations with Javon and Tavon this week. We'll see you in two weeks. We're taking a little hiatus. Bye.